humbled by your great sacrifice through Jesus, your son. Lord, I'm grateful to be an heir and a joint heir with Jesus, that every blade of grass in the new heaven and the new earth, that every great moment of peace is ours to have. And this was because you loved us. You're pleased with us. Even though we screwed up, even though we sinned against you, you love us. And you wanted us to be in relationship with you. And so you began the process from the moment of creation. And it's been ongoing. And many have come into a right relationship with you, and many have not. Lord, I pray that we will all be those that have. Help us, Lord. It would be so easy to be distracted by the bright lights, the gift giving and receiving, the rituals that surround this season. Lord, it's easy to be wrapped up in anger, disagreement. People get wrapped up in the political or the sports stuff or the money stuff. Lord, there's a lot of things in this life that would drag us away from what's really important. And it's so easy. Bless you. And Father, do bless us. Do bless us as we seek you again today to reach new heights in Jesus. I pray for those who are trying to be here this morning. Father, I pray for Kim as she's worshiping in her, her, her church this morning. And, and she said they'd be praying for us and we're praying for them, Lord. We ask you to lift them up and help them glorify you and hear from you. And the same for us. We turn it over to you. You're in charge. We recognize that. Whatever we've screwed up, whatever we've done, however we've gotten in the way, it's time for us to get out of the way, Lord, and let you do what you want to do. We commend this service into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to stand and sing some Christmas songs. I need some percussion help up here. Christmas with Anybody sleigh bells. Got rhythm? Come on, come get it. Get them before they're gone. You should be proficient, right? You should know what to do. All right, stand up, middle section. Come on, on feet. Let's go. Not about you. Let's go. What you want? It's about me.
on so if I ain't recognizing now yep something back there okay all right what have you been reading what have you been seeing it's the Christmas season uh, we had an interesting discussion on Tuesday night about Christmas carols and every time one comes on the radio if you get one of my two favorite radio stations on it's about all they're playing is Christmas songs and every time one comes on, I keep thinking about how some of the lyrics in there are biblical or follow the Bible account, and some of them sometimes don't. And I wondered how somebody would write a Christmas song that doesn't follow what the Bible says, and it becomes so popular for a hundred years. And I think, well, you know, a lot of people sing things that they don't really know what they're singing, that kind of thing. Um, so well, I've been inspired a number of ways this week. How about you? What have you seen? What have you heard? What have you read? What is God saying? Jason. So... The past couple of weeks, my family has been not feeling so well. We've been sick for a while. Yeah, a lot of sick and what that brought to me is that God needs to sit so we can take time to relax, praise Him, and spend time with the family that we have. Because we don't know how long we're going to have before we're not going to be able to see Him again. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. I'm not sure God. Makes us sick, but I understand what you're saying. Okay, that's good work. Yes, very good. Go ahead. I'm doing a reading plan in my Bible app about Christmas songs. I'm okay. reading of all different kinds of Christmas songs. And the one yesterday was about Go Tell on the Mountain. And I did not know that Go Tell on the Mountain was written about slaves and finding joy in the hope in Christ, even though their life is horrible times, very difficult. And so the devotion then was talking about. Even when life is hard and things are not going your way, there's still joy in Christ and joy in the Christmas season because of the gift of Christ, and we need to look for those things. Yeah, that's a good word. Uh, you might just reminded me of how uh, you may or may, may or may not have heard of the book Uncle Todd's Cabin. I've used this little phrase a couple times, but I never forget. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote that book, and Abraham Lincoln would later call her the little woman who wrote the book that started the Civil War, and you can take it for what it is, whether that's true or not. But the bottom line is that at the end scene of that book, he is on the barge going down the Mississippi River with a slavery where he'll, from which he'll never return. He's been a slave, um, got away, and then was recaptured, and now is going down to a, what they know is a hard slave master, and he'll almost sort of die. And he's laying on the barge of the boat, crying, weeping. And, you, and every, when you're reading the book, you think maybe he's crying or weeping because his situation really sucks. And that's terrible. He'll probably never come back. He'll die. His health is already bad. He's already been beaten severely, that kind of thing. You think, man, he's, got, he's never going to see his family again. He has a wife and kids that he's never going to see again. I think he's crying for this horrible situation that he's in, when in reality, he's, he's crying for the people around him that are wrapped up, the slaves and slavers wrapped up in the slave trade and the boat operators and everything like that who don't know Jesus. And he's crying, wishing, because he knows when he dies, he'll go straight to heaven. But he knows when they die, they'll go straight to hell. And I think that profoundly affected a United States of America that realized that if you're a human being, you have a chance of being saved. And if you've been saved, your situation is eternally better than someone who has not been saved. And so we look at life circumstances, and we're talking a little bit about this in sermon today. We look at life circumstances, and we misinterpret them. The truth is, the wealthiest of us, the strongest, the smarter, smartest of us on earth, without Christ, are headed for a horrible end, the likes of which no one would want. Whereas the poorest stuff, the blind, the wretched, he who sits in the, you know, in the ashes and scrapes himself with pot shards who has trusted in Christ, trusted in God, is, ended, is, is headed for an end more glorious than we can imagine. Even though we like to imagine, we think about how awesome we have to use it in the general terms, because not having been there, it's impossible for us to imagine. So your circumstances are not based on 
are not based in reality. The reality of your reality is wrapped up in what you have done with Jesus Christ. That's the key. And Jesus would say, go and do the works of my Father. And the Jews would say, what are the works of your Father? And he said, believe on the one in whom he is sent. And what has happened is, people did, and people started being saved, and the church expanded and grew massively. But somewhere along the lines, and I think it was about the Enlightenment, we started thinking you can believe and think something's true without letting it affect you. It's not like that. We have to be affected at every level. When he says believe on the one whom you have sent, we let Jesus be in charge at every level. Now go tell that on the mountain. That is good news. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It matters to whom you belong, for whom you are living, who you are living. Anyway, praise God. Go tell it on the mountain. Good stuff. Anybody else? All right, we're going to pray together at this time, and we'll do a little tithes and offerings, and we'll worship, uh, and then go to the Word. And I'm excited about what God has said to me this week, and I hope I'll be able to convey it on. Do the best, okay? All right, Brother Tim, would you pray for us as we transition to tithes and offerings, and then we'll worship? Our Lord and Father, we gather here today to honor you, to learn about you, to praise you, and to what you bless us with, God, this is here all right, we're going to ask you to stand with us again this morning if you would like to. Children, young at heart, if you'd like to learn some new motions this morning, we've got some for you. been working through something in my own life that I will use as an illustration. Please don't hold it against me uh, today as we open this um, sermon. And it is this. Since pre-COVID, um, I have been doing a poor job of, uh, by, by the world's standards, mind you. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing a poor job or not. I wouldn't want to judge myself, I guess, but I feel like maybe they're right, of what's called self-care. That is to say, make, I've been taking my Sabbath faithfully every week, uh, but for example, in 2019, uh, generally speaking, I am in, uh, allowed to or entitled to by the church and by the Life Station to take four weeks of vacation. In 2019, I failed to take about a week and a half of that. In 2020, I failed to take three and a half weeks of it. In 2021, I failed to take 
a week and a half of it. And I told myself I wasn't going to let that happen again this year. And it's 2022, and I've now taken about uh, seven days of the four weeks. And so I'm not doing a good job of that. So this week I forced it. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take two weeks or two days of vacation this week. Um, and this is what happened in the two days of vacation. On the one hand, it was awesome. Like I got a lot of things done that I wanted to get done. I read the Bible. I prayed. I sought God. I, I did. I mean, not that I don't do that normally, but I was able to do it on things that I've been thinking about or questioning, wondering about. And I, so it was really neat that I got to take those two days. And then plus I had my Sabbath on Thursday. So really I had three days. Um, but then the flip side of that was I'm all discombobulated. I'm all, I was all confused. Like uh, I, things that I keep my hand on or things that I keep working on uh, were like falling apart because I wasn't doing them. I wasn't taking care of them and making sure that they happened. And so uh, then I thought about that and I thought, how much of what we are doing is what we think is right, is what we think we can do, like uh, organizing ourselves, or maybe you use a schedule, maybe you don't, maybe you use a list, maybe you don't, whatever. Um, prioritizing things like my house has got to be taken care of and my bills got to be taken care of and my family's got, pardon me, got to be taken care of and that kind of thing. And when we do that, how much of that is us keeping the ball rolling, making sure it works, making sure things go the way we want them to go, and how much of it is what God really wants us to do? We're going to look today at a few of the circumstances of Jesus' birth and these are largely used when apologetic, apologi- I'm going to mess this word up, apologeticists, it's a tough word, but people who explain or make a reasoned defense for how we know what we know <coughs> in Scripture, those people, when they do that, um, they use these three details of Jesus' birth that we're going to look at today as large evidence, strong evidence, that Jesus was exactly who he says he is. But I submit to you that if Jesus were given the choice as a person, whether it be as God in the flesh, because God is a person, right? Or as a human being, which he was 100% both. He was 100% the son of God, 100% a man. Either way, he might have chosen not to do it this way. And the results of that are kind of unique and they speak to us, okay? So grab your Bibles if you would. Grab onto them. And if you didn't bring one, it's okay, I'm going to read it to you, but I would encourage you to bring your Bible, your favorite Bible, the one you like to make notes in and so on, because you might run into a little note that you wrote there, or something you underlined, or you might see a word that's translated a little different in your Bible than that's in mine or something, it might provoke your attention, and God might do something through that. But maybe give me a hoot to holler, amen, as we go to Matthew chapter 1. God help us. Amen, thank you so much. Now this is essentially... Uh, a, a shorter, Matthew gives us a shorter, condensed down version of the Christmas story um, from a slightly different perspective. Remember the book of Matthew? Matthew was uh, 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 writing essentially to the Jews, all right? And so the, this book may even have been written in Hebrew originally when it was first released, right? And so if that's true, this would be the Jews going, is this the guy? Is he right? Should we be paying attention to what Jesus is about? Right, And so Matthew's writing from that perspective. I'm going to begin reading in chapter 1 in verse 18. Okay, We'll go by fast because it's, it's mostly a story that you're familiar uh, with, I'm sure. Okay, Chapter 1, verse 18 begins like this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. Now, we, we could go in and break down those little details and say, okay, what it means to be betrothed, what it means to be disgraced, what happened, you know, what, and all that. But they didn't have to do that. They fully understood that. That being betrothed was the same as being married. She, was being, she had been found unfaithful. He could have had her stoned in the street or outside on the edge of town, but instead he chose not to disgrace her and was going to put her away secretly. And verse 20 says, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now, there's a few things in there you might study on, but again, they would have known it already, every, all those little details. What does the name Jesus mean? Uh, what does it mean to be conceived in the Holy Spirit? What is or who is the Holy Spirit? It's the third person of the Trinity, all that. They would have kind of known all that. Now, all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now there's a chapter division there and people generally kind of stop there. But if you'll notice right after that, he goes into the story about the wise men. While there is a huge time gap there, which we'll even see in this story, um, even though there's a huge time gap there, we need a little bit of this story to understand what's going on. In verse, verse 1 of chapter 2, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, and notice there's no time frame given there, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now we know that's a long journey. We don't know, still don't really have a time frame. Verse 3, And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Now they were troubled because he was troubled largely, because they didn't know what was going to go on. Verse 4, And gathering together all the chief priests, scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. Having heard the king, they went away. And lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They came into the house and saw the child. We're going to skip down a little bit. Look at verse 13. Now when they had departed, this is when they're leaving now, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. A little further down, 16. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, and I would submit to you by the angel, but he doesn't know that, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its environs from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. So now we have the time frame. It comes at the end of what we just read. Basically what we have is Jesus is born in Bethlehem, a baby to Mary, a virgin, and her husband to whom she is betrothed, and he keeps her a virgin until she bears the child, until after, I'm sure, so she had time to heal and so on. And then the Magi comes, they inquire of the Magi when the star appeared, then the babies are killed from two years old and under. So we know there is a gap of two, up to two years' time before the arrival of the Magi because they said the star appeared a year and a half ago or two years ago or whatever, and that's why he killed all the babies in two years. So we understand the time frame of it now. But notice that there is real exposure of Jesus at the beginning of this. Jesus is in dire straits, dire circumstances. And I submit to you that all of the dire circumstances that Jesus is in, in this story, are because of God's promises, because of what God prophesied. So flip back in your Bible, if you would, go back to the left. We're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 7. Okay, going into the big prophets in the Old Testament. I had to go back about 40 pages or so, maybe 60, let's see. No, it was more than that, about 100, 120 pages, something like that. And we're in Isaiah, big seven, Isaiah chapter seven. Now look here at, uh, we'll start reading in verse 10, but we're targeting verse 14. Then the Lord spoke to Ahaz, he was the king at that time, okay? The Lord spoke to Ahaz saying, as a sign to yourself from the Lord your God, Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. In other words, I'm not going to, I'm not going to test you, God. I'm not going to mistrust you. Then he said, listen now, O house of David, it is too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of God as well. In other words, he's saying, okay, clearly you've got 
you, you're cheating people, you've got all this sin and wickedness and all that kind of thing, so you're trying the patience of men. But he says, now you're going to try my patience too? And in answer to that challenge, God answers himself essentially. And he says, therefore, because you would not only try the patience of men, you're not only sinning against each other, but you're actually sinning against me. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good until the time at which he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So talking about the, the kings that they were feared of, that they were afraid of, that would be taken care of a long time before the baby would grow up to be like that. And this verse, 714, then is latched onto by the Jewish people as a promise about the Messiah. That the Messiah would be born of a virgin. First of all, that the Messiah would be born. And so women all throughout the Jewish society began to go, maybe my child will be the Messiah. The boy child was born. Like, it could be. It could be, the, could be me. And they would pray to God, God, let my child be the Messiah because they knew that the Messiah would be born because of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 7, verse 14. And it's, pri- it's pretty much the only place. It's very solid, but they knew that that was what was going to happen. There's a little bit elsewhere, but here it's very clear that he would be born. And then born of a virgin. Now, interestingly enough, there is a young woman in Ahaz's day who has a baby. And some, some like splinter groups, if you will, took it to believe that that young woman's baby was the baby that was prophesied. Except the results don't work out because they suffer. And those people that they were afraid of come down and wind up wiping out the, the northern tribes completely. And they take, they take over Samaria. Okay, so it doesn't it doesn't pan out. And what do we know about prophecy? When God when someone prophesies on behalf of God and it doesn't come true, that's not prophecy, right? That's a false prophet. So we know that wasn't true. But there was a woman that was born that was a young woman who had a child. She wasn't a virgin, but she had a child. And they thought, hey, this could be the child in that day. And so the Jews that wanted to not believe in Jesus could walk away from Jesus because he was born to an unwed mother who was clearly unfaithful. And they could say, no, not Jesus. He's not the one. Because we think that guy back in Ahaz's time, we can't explain why it still didn't work out, but we think that was the one, right? But the Jews that could believe, the Jews that believe in God and know how God worked, realized that that baby that was back in Ahaz's day was nothing more than a forecasting of the Messiah. And and 99% of the Jewish people expected that this verse, Isaiah 7, 14, was a prophecy about Jesus. Not Jesus, about the Christ. Okay? About the Messiah. Okay. So... Jesus could not orchestrate being born to a young, unwed mother. Obviously, God could, and Jesus, as God in heaven, he could do that, right? But as a human being, there's no way that that could happen. I didn't get to choose who my mom and dad were. You didn't get to choose who your mom and dad were, okay? And so Jesus didn't choose who his mom and dad was or the situations into which he was born. But now, all of a sudden, he's under real threat of hunger, starvation even, uh, persecution, Being destroyed by Herod the king could have well been destroyed. But the angels intervene, right? There was no abortion. That wasn't on the table. He was going to be born. Once the Holy Spirit conceived him with Mary, he was going to be born. To Mary, to a young mother who didn't know squat. She maybe knew a little bit of animal husbandry. That was about it. She probably picked up some, by the time she had the baby, she picked up some from her cousin Elizabeth, who was an older woman, who was having her first child, but it helped a lot of women previously have children. So she probably picked up some from her, and like that. But the bottom line is, he was born into dangerous circumstances. And partly, that proves that he was who he says he was. There's nothing that Jesus, people, some people say, well, Jesus, you know, he offended the leaders so that he would be crucified, because clearly Isaiah 53 says he would be crucified, so he needed to be crucified, so he did that on purpose so that he would be crucified so people would believe in him. But that's not really how it went down, is it? You read the story, time and again, they were going to arrest him, and he kept walking away because it wasn't his time, and finally, he's crucified. Here, one of the greatest factors is, number one, that he would be born, and number two, that he would be born to a young virgin woman. That's incredible. And it's something that happened. It's real circumstances. All right? Now go to Micah chapter 5. Going to the right. Into the little prophets. Although Micah might be a little offended by that. But 
He doesn't. He does. We don't have as much of his writings as everybody else. So you can go all the way over to the right. I'll get there. I didn't mic mark mine either. I told you I'm all discombobulated. There it is. Okay, Micah five. Verse 2, all right, we'll read from verse 1. Now muster yourselves, troops, daughters of troops. They have laid siege against us with a rod. They will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. Here's the verse. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth, his goings forth are from long ago from the days of eternity. And, of course, they latched on to that verse and said, this is clearly about the Messiah. That phrase, Bethlehem Ephrathah, is really important because there are actually several places called Bethlehem. Bethlehem kind of means like house of bread. And there are several places in Jerusalem called Bethlehem. But there's only one, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Ephrathah was its previous name. And so to... They kept it there so people could distinguish which Bethlehem they were talking about. So now we know that the Messiah would be born, that he would be born to a virgin, and that he would be born in Bethlehem, and a specific Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah. And again, so people challenge, well, how do you know this was the guy? How How should they have known this was the guy? What's unique about him that he couldn't have orchestrated during his life? He did miracles, sure, but how do we know he didn't miracle, do miracles by another kind of power or whatever? But now we have him born, born to a virgin, and born in a specific place. Both of these texts that I've just read to you were spoken first and then written down over 600 years before his birth. Contemporary prophets working at roughly the same time while Ahaz, Jotham, and Hezekiah were king. So 740 to 697 BC. So 697 plus years they said these prophecies. And then Jesus was born to a virgin in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. 700 years. God makes promises and sometimes it takes a long time for those promises to come true, but they always come true. We have one text left. and It's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And then in the conclusion, we'll have two verses as well. Okay, so in, if you're in your Bible, you're going back to Isaiah. That's where we were. Did this on, in this order on purpose. Go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 9. And this one is at Isaiah 9, 6. And this is what he says. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So this is the Messiah that they were expecting, a child who would be born to us. And the government would then rest on his shoulders, and his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, if you're reading in a King James Bible right now, you may see a comma between Wonderful and Counselor, because that's the way they chose to translate it. But I think our best understanding here is that he has... He's given four names, wonderful counselor. In other words, he is our leader. He is our guider. He tells us what to do and we do it. And he's telling us what to do that's best for us under the most difficult of circumstances. Still, he gives us what to do that's best for us. Mighty God. Nothing was made except that which was made through him. It's a very appropriate title. Eternal Father. The Messiah, Jesus, would be called Eternal Father. Remember that Jesus is not only God the Son, but he is part of the Trinity. And he would say, I and the Father are one. And then Prince of Peace. He is the one, the ruler, the guide, the leader of peace so that we can have peace with God, so we can have peace with one another. If we both have peace with God, then we will have peace with one another. And so that we can have peace with the earth eventually when it's the new heaven, the new earth. In the meantime, there will be groanings. But there will be no no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Once he starts, it doesn't stop. It may look like the church is struggling or Christians are struggling, but there is no stopping. God will fulfill his promises 
And on the throne of David, he will sit forever. He will establish it. That means he'll make it solid and he will uphold it. That means he will keep it from falling down no matter what happens. And he will do so with justice and righteousness. Justice is when you get what you deserve. And righteousness is when you're right by God, generally right. And that righteousness only comes through, we now know, the sacrificial blood of Jesus. He says, from then on and forevermore, the zeal, that means the energy and the passion, the power and the might put into action of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Okay, so there's a few things I want you to see. This really affected me, so I'm going to try to get through it without getting upset, but here we go. The first thing is that Jesus comes from humble beginnings. Humble beginnings. Now, he was rich. He was still God the Son, right? And But he wasn't rich financially, and he didn't have the resources of the world at his disposal. Uh, he didn't have armies to defend him or wipe out his enemies, He didn't have kingly authority on the earth. He didn't get to tell people what to do and they did it or they died, right? He was rich in that he was God, but he was poor as a man. He literally took on humble beginnings and I can't imagine why he would do that if he wasn't trying to convey something especially important. Somebody asked me this in the youth Bible study on Tuesday night. I said, why? Why was he born to a, a a young virgin female? I mean, that's ridiculous. That's not even something that should happen like ever, let alone God be born that way. And I thought, well, you know, you've got a point. But the answer is God's making a point, right? There is a process being explained here. There is a thing that God is showing us on how God works and how relationship with God works. And we cannot deny that Jesus at the beginning of his life had humble beginnings. And because of that, he was cold and he was hungry and he was in danger, Those are circumstances. Circumstances. But more than that, there was every reason for no one to listen to him. He comes from a background to which no one was... In fact, later on in life, they'll say, is this not Jesus who was born, the son of Joseph, that guy? And now he talks like this. Right? They had every reason to ignore Jesus. He comes from humble beginnings. He was raised by people who probably did not raise him. Truth be known, I know what they're doing. Especially not when they heard all those fantastic things at his birth. Right? Parents have a hard time disciplining their children and taking care of them well when their children are exceptional in some way. And they might be exceptional in a way that they're learning disabled. Or they might be exceptional in a way that they're incredibly genius. Right? Some are both. There are those who are supposedly learning disabled, but they're a savant in playing the piano or doing algebra or whatever. So then it becomes a problem. I have a dear friend of mine, and uh, we've been praying together and talking together some pretty much once a month right now, and he's going, stuff, going through stuff with his teenage son because his teenage son is, borderline, is on the autism spectrum, and he said every time things don't go well in the house, he's loud and he's yelling and he's saying mean things. And, like that. and as his dad, he's trying to get him under control and teach him how to do better, but what winds up happening is they just have this butting of the heads. He doesn't know how to handle him because he has, at that moment, his teenage son is taking all the power and the authority on himself because of his disability, but he's taking it on himself and his dad is trying to stop him. And when they're going at it like this, it would turn into a fist fight or break stuff and that kind of thing. And that doesn't get the job done. So he's like, I need wisdom. I need discernment. I have to figure out how to handle this. Imagine you're parenting Jesus, the son of God. In some of the not books of the Bible, Jesus is pictured as being able to do miracles the whole time he was coming up and doing some crazy things like... uh, turning a bully into a bird or uh, you know, doing miraculous things that, to put people in their place and so on, as if he were precocious when he was young. And I don't believe that. He never sinned. That's what the Bible says. He always did the right thing. He honored Joseph and Mary. But the truth is, while they had it easy because he would always honor them, they had it hard because they needed to always honor him. Jesus comes from humble beginnings and difficulty They flee before Herod sends out his men to kill them because otherwise they would have killed Jesus. They flee and take the wealth that the Magi brought them and live on it in Egypt. Oh, and by the way, they do that because there is another prophecy that that would fulfill that says, out of Egypt I called my son. See how one fulfills another and brings about another. Ultimately, Jesus is heading toward crucifixion, but right now, he's a baby. He comes from humble beginnings. Secondly, 
These humble beginnings are fulfilling promises made by His Father. The bottom line is, if Jesus was not born, God didn't, didn't keep His promise. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, God didn't keep His promise. If Jesus was not born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah, God didn't keep His promise. God is keeping His promises. But it goes beyond that. When God and Abraham are having it out in Genesis chapter 12 and they're making a covenant between them, God has, as was customary in that day, he has Abraham split a bunch of bodies of animals in the top half over here and the bottom half over there. And then normally what would happen is the two people making the covenant would go walking between those bodies. And what they were signifying was that if we don't keep our promises to one another, that we'll be like these animals. That we'll be like these animals. It will be split in two, destroyed like these animals. And that's what they would do. They'd shake hands, hug on it, and they would walk between the animals. Except when it comes time to walk between the animals, God doesn't ask Abraham to walk between the split animals. Instead, God floats a flaming, flaming brazier between the animals, saying what? Saying, if I don't keep my promises to you, I, God, will become like these animals. And you say, well, that could never happen, right? Except that's what happened on the cross. God was guaranteeing Abraham that he was going to keep his promises, fulfill his promises, and he was going to do everything in his power to forgive him of the sins that rightfully would have put Abraham in hell for an eternity. Just because he's the father of the faith doesn't mean he didn't have sins. He surely did. God was keeping his promises. He was fulfilling promises that he had made, and he was doing it now through his son. He promised how his son would come. He promised what things would be like then and what he was going to do. In fact, he essentially became human to do all of that. That's what it was all about. This is all about fulfilling promises. (coughs) His greatness was, of course, assured and anchored in God. Jesus' greatness was, of course, assured and anchored in God. It was Jesus who would one day be the heir of all things. Right? And so God was going to make sure that happened. God went to Joseph and sent Joseph an angel in a dream. Right? God went to Mary, sent Mary an angel. The Holy Spirit conceived the child in Mary. God, I submit to you, sent the Magi to bring the wealth so that Jesus' family would have what they needed to flee to Egypt. But even if you don't believe that and think that's purely coincidence, Joseph heard from a dream that they needed to leave before Herod's men came and killed all the babies. And it goes on and on and on. And you see God intervening consistently to ensure that his promises are fulfilled. And it is God's greatness that is assuring and anchoring Jesus and that it's going to turn out so. It's God's greatness that put him in humble beginnings. It's God's greatness that allows him to fulfill his promises. And it's God's greatness that is assuring him and anchoring him in God. Remember that it says the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And already we are at our conclusion, but it's a doozy. I submit to you that everyone in this room has humble beginnings. You have humble beginnings, of course, because you were born a baby, right? You do realize that until the age of one or two years old, you used to poop in your pants and somebody had to take care of you. Some of you went a lot longer than that. Some of us, I don't know. I don't know when I stopped going back to my pants. We all had humble beginnings. But that's a physical humble beginning. But on top of that, we also have a sinful humble beginning. We all were under the effects of original sin. Which means if you never sinned, you would still die for the sins of mankind and go to hell for an eternity. And you're like, but that doesn't make sense. That's not fair. Righteousness is found in trusting God in the way that he would make because we have the original sin from Adam and Eve. If the Bible says that we were all present in Adam and when he sinned, we were coded in and combined with that sin. The reason you have a selfish nature and would tend to lie to get out of a tough spot is because of Adam's sin. The reason you have a selfish nature and would take, tend to take that $100 bill that you find on the parking lot without looking around first to see if somebody just dropped it, tend to, I didn't say you would, but the reason you might tend to do that and go, well, finders keepers, nobody's here. The reason you might tend to do that is because of Adam's sin. The reason you might look at a member of the opposite sex who's particularly attractive and think about how attractive they are is because of Adam's sin. Your tendency to sin, your flesh nature, is because of Adam's sin. 
Now, very quickly, as you were coming up as a young person, probably before you could ever count yourself as an adolescent, you sinned against God. And because of that sin, the wages of that sin is death. That is a humble beginning. We have humble beginnings. Jesus was showing us by His birth, by His being laid in a manger, by His being wrapped in swaddling cloths, by His, being, by his coming as a human being, rather than it, like an angel of light or a glory or with thousands of people surrounding Him to protect Him always every day of His life, to stop Him from stumbling or ever being hurt, or armies to protect Him from being crucified. Jesus was coming from those humble beginnings because you and I come from humble beginnings. Because all humans come from humble beginnings. That is the system that God ordained. But the problem is, as soon as we're basically old enough, what do we do? Well, generally speaking, they call it like the terrible twos. We stop obeying our parents. We start rebelling. We want to do things. We have to be disciplined. Then we've got a little crack on a high knee to get ourselves under control, to teach us and remind us that what we did was dangerous and wrong, get us moving in the right direction. And that discipline that protects us from our undisciplined nature, from our sinful nature, that same discipline then teaches us that we don't have authority, that we don't have strength to make choices, that we are not wise and cannot discern. And you wind up in a trap that is a humble beginning, but it's a trap where you are in very real danger of never making a decision for Christ throughout your entire life and winding up in hell. That is not what God wants. God does not want people to go to hell, and therefore He sent Jesus into humble beginnings first and foremost to remind us that we all have humble beginnings. Jesus was then moved from there by the zeal of God, the prophet tells us. By God's power and His passion, mightily applied. God moved Him from there. You and I, we were born, from the moment you were in the womb, Psalm 8 says, you had the ability to rebuke the devourer, to rebuke the enemy. You have always, 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 as a human being created in God, had the ability to rebuke a demon, tell it to leave you alone, and it had to do so. Because you were created in the image of God, but you lost that in your rebellious choices and then in your discipline and some more rebellious choices and some more discipline and so on. So you lost that along the way. You lost your God nature. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not my words. Paul's words. And before that, essentially Jesus' words. He says, whoever sins, sin has become his master. And that's what we did. We had the power to rebuke the enemy, but we lost it along the way, dead in our trespasses and sins. We were lost even if we didn't trespass against God. Can't even think of when we did it, which the Bible says we have done it. All have done it and fallen short of the glory of God. But even if we can't think of when we did that, we would have lost that power that is inherently in our human nature by being human and a descendant of Adam who sinned against God when we were all in him. In fact, at first it seems like this is not reasonable or fair. Why is it necessary that we all come from humble beginnings? That doesn't seem right. I wouldn't have eaten the fruit, we say, in our pride of arrogance. Because you probably would have. I probably would have. The wisest amongst us, not led by the Holy Spirit, not convicted ultimately, and then possibly even then. Because don't we love to not do what it is that God's telling us to do when we think we know better? To not listen to what God is saying and say, well, I didn't know it was God. It's so easy to make those kid-like mistakes when dealing with the power of God telling us to be better, to do better, to do the right things, to stop holding grudges, to stop holding on to anger, to malice, hate, lies, deceit mistrust, criticism, love of money, love of hobbies. And every time we are told we would be wise to die to self and instead follow Him faithfully, we go, well, that might not really be God. Or in this case, it doesn't seem like that really applies because it seems like it's not necessary for us to come from humble beginnings. It seems like it's not really our fault. Even if we hadn't sinned, we'd be dead in trespasses and sins. But see, but see, that is our humble beginnings. And from there, we like Jesus, can we, ha- we can have the same God on our side. We can have the same God working for us, the same God sending angels and sending messages and sending His Word and doing miracles and the same God protecting us by His Holy Spirit. That God, through Jesus, who demonstrates 
the model and made it possible causes us to be reborn if indeed we can figure out enough of, that we are in humble circumstances to realize that we need to be lifted up. Oh, how dangerous it is to be smart or to be wealthy, to be handsome or to be skilled. Because in all of that, you find the ability to go, well, I guess I'm okay. And if I'm okay, I don't need to be reborn. I don't need to be elevated by the God of the universe. If Jesus had come as a king in a palace, you and I might have thought salvation was for the rich and wealthy. If he had come into modern day and become a, a supermodel or a TikTok influencer with billions of followers, you and I might have thought operating those things that way, doing it the way those people do that, is how you get saved. But it isn't. You must find yourself in humble beginnings first and foremost as Jesus did the God of the universe did. We look at our circumstances and we think, this stinks. This isn't fair. May we compare our lonely stables to that palace of someone else. James wrote it this way. He said, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. And in that, that context there, that verse is essentially continue to humble yourselves. We think it's like a humble, like I can just have a mental thought that I'm, I'm worthless and that's enough, but it isn't. Humble yourselves before the Lord as he will exalt you. And Peter wrote this he's in 1 Peter 5, 5 to 6. He says, for everyone who exalts himself, that means if you can lift yourself up. You ever hear the whole old saying, like when you're in trouble, lift yourself up by your bootstraps and keep going, right? Or when you get to the bottom of the rope, tie a knot and hang on. If you can lift yourself up by your bootstraps, spiritually speaking, or if you can tie a knot and hang on, spiritually speaking, then you're not trusting in Jesus. You're not humble. You think if there's just a knot here, I can hold on. I just need a little bit of help to be able to hold on. Or I've got these bootstraps for a reason, not just for putting my boots on, but so I can pull myself up. And you can use another analogy if you prefer But he says, for everyone who exalts himself, that's everyone that lifts himself up, will be humbled. That means God going to put you down. When If you don't realize that your circumstances are humble, and they may be humble today, they should be. If you don't realize that your circumstances are humble, then there is no reason for you to call out to him and truly trust in him, and he will not exalt you. He said it this way. He said, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. But let us not confuse ourselves. You were created in the image of God. You created from a piece of dirt, that's a fact. But God's Holy Spirit, life power was driven into you by Him. You are not meant to be a piece of dirt now. You are not meant to be worthless now. You are not meant to be hopeless now. You are not meant to be giving in to the ways of the world, won over, distracted, tempted, whatever. You are better than that in Christ. And if you are not better in that in Christ, then maybe you are not in Christ. In which case... It's time you realize you are in humble circumstances and let God lift you up. Jesus himself said it this way in Matthew 23, 12. It says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And again, people take that verse out of context and talk about, well, my attitude toward God. I got to think I'm lowly. I've got to think I need God. I got to remember I need God for everything. John 15, I can do nothing except that which I do through him. And so now I'm good because I'm humble. I recognize how powerful my God is and how weak I am compared to Him and so on. But it's, it's not like that. In Matthew 23, he's talking about, he says, uh, people are concerned about where they sit. They're concerned about being seen and what other people think of them. He says, don't be called Father. Let no one on this earth call you Father and call no man Father because your Father in heaven alone is your Father. You can have a human dad and you can respect him, but Jesus said, don't call any man father. And then he went on to say, to talk about in that same section, which actually ends with Matthew 23, 12, he talks about, don't let anybody call you leader. Don't let anybody think of you as their leader. Because you have one leader. Don't let anybody call you rabbi, which means teacher. You have one teacher. You all, we all have one teacher. That's why in the church we have pastors, not rabbis, not leaders, etc. I am not your leader. I'm not your officer. Right? 
I am a servant. I am a gift of God to you. Take me or don't. That's your option. It's the same thing as salvation. It's the same thing as Jesus himself. Except Jesus was the leader. He was the teacher. All to bring people to God. In fact, he says that he ends with it this way. He says, we are all brothers and sisters. I said, you are, because it was Jesus speaking. But, but he told us, we are all brothers and sisters in this room. If you recognize your humble position and allow God to lift you up and make you saved, then anybody else in this room who has done the same thing is your brother and sister. We talk about family. Jesus said, unless you hate your mother and father, you cannot be my disciple. And that doesn't mean you've got to hate your mother and father. Literally, he was using figurative, poetic language. It means that Jesus must be first. And I'm not talking about in humbleness. I'm talking about you recognize your humble circumstances of your life. And you don't try to get up. You don't try to put yourself up. You let God make of you what, you, what he will and fulfill his promises to you. And you do that. And then you will be a Christian. You are elevated from humble circumstances to be a follower of Jesus. And that perfect nature that was in you, that is God's nature, begins to get revealed. You can rebuke demons and evil spirits. You can be the positive word in someone's life. You can begin to overcome troubles and difficulty. You can be a giver and a servant. In Matthew 23, 12, Jesus said, whoever exalts me shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall, exalt, shall be exalted me or maybe be exalted by me, but maybe you know this part of that verse a little bit better where he says, the greatest amongst you shall be your servant. And a servant is not a person who does what they want to do. A servant is a person that does what other people need. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So I, I think you're getting the picture. I want to share these verses with you last. If you're still following along in your Bible, Luke chapter 3. And then I'll try to bring this all together and we'll be done. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> so in Luke... We already know, we talked about this last week, about how Luke is, was uh, assembling all the eyewitness testimony and doing the research and everything, and, and he set out to lay out the facts of what we know about the ministry of Jesus. And in Luke 3.16, he's talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. And it's right here. I'll read from 15. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he might be the Christ. See, John was doing some amazing things. He wasn't saying he was the Christ. In fact, he was saying he wasn't the Christ. But he was doing some amazing things and hearts were being turned toward God. And they started to wonder, is he the Christ? In 16, it says, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water. But one who is coming, who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We'll read 17 in a second. Notice the difference between John the Baptist, who was baptizing them with water, and he said another one would come. He was pointing to the Messiah, who was Jesus, who was started out in humble beginnings, elevated by God to the point he's about to begin his public ministry. And he says, this one who is coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, that is the third person of the Trinity, He is God, the Spirit, and fire. And kid yourself not, which we'll see it very clearly in a second, fire is always judgment and justice. Always in the Scripture. Symbolic of judgment and justice. In other words, God is going to make a decision. He's going to look at you and He's going to look at me and He's going to decide what did we do with what we were given. Do we bemoan our circumstances? Oh, woe is me, I have humble beginnings. Did we turn our circumstances into something awesome? Oh, woe is me, I had humble beginnings, but now I'm a millionaire. Now I'm a billionaire reels influencer. Right now I started a YouTube channel. I can sell vacuum cleaners with the best of them and I got a big old house in the suburbs. Did we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make something great of us? By the way, both of those two things will, will net you zero on the judgment. Did you, regardless of your house size, regardless of your capabilities, your wisdom, your clothes, your furniture, your finances, your job, your relationships, what did you do with Jesus? That's the judgment. That's the justice. Did you allow Jesus to be in charge of your life, to elevate you from those humble beginnings to the greatness that you were born to? That's the question. 
And in case you were confused that that was the question, he then goes on to say this in 17, and his winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his fleshing, his threshing floor, there we go, and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See this baby Jesus that she wrapped in some leftover clothes and laid in an animal trough in a stables in Bethlehem? She already knew, and you could read it in Mary's song, and we read a little bit of it last week. She already knew that that baby Jesus was going to turn the fortunes of men. But this baby Jesus, if you can't recognize your humble positions, if you can't submit yourself to God through Jesus and let Him make something of you, make what He wants of you, don't take this as a joke. Sometimes fulfilling God's promises will cost you your life. It did in Jesus' case. In order to fulfill God's promises to man, Jesus had to be crucified. And there have been many martyrs over the years, people who are living for Jesus and refused to stop living for Jesus and died for their faith. Some of them never saw it coming. Like Mary, the girl in the Columbine shooting, who was just who was sitting in the library, and all of a sudden there's a shooter in the building, and the next thing you know, there's a gun to her head, and he said, Deny Christ and I'll let you live. And she refused, and he shot her in the head and killed her. 17 years old. It can come at any time. But I submit to you, She would never deny him. She chose not to deny him because she had tried everything else. She knew she had come from humble beginnings. She knew that Jesus had won her soul. She knew that the Holy Spirit had entered into her and sealed her up for eternity. And she knew that if he pulled the trigger after she refused to deny Christ, if he pulled the trigger, she would immediately be in heaven with God. How could she say no to that? How could you or I? But if Jesus had come in the palace, you might think the way to God is through riches or good choices or hard work. But he came and was laid in a manger. He was born to a virgin in Bethlehem to remind us that we come from humble beginnings. We must be born again. And it is by the power and zeal of God that this will be accomplished. Not your passion, That's one of the things that bugs me about. By the way, the word passion in the New Testament is never used. There is no passion as a Christian. You don't have it. You can be like, well, I was so passionate when I first got saved. Maybe it's because when you first got saved, you knew the truth. And now it's been a while. And you're letting it wane. affect you less. But if that is so, do not forget this, that one would come who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with unquenchable fire. And his when his winnowing fork, that's the fork of which they sort the wheat with, was already in his hand to clear, thoroughly clear his threshing floor. That's a tough phrase to say. And to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff like unquenchable fire. You and I must choose not to be chaff. We must choose to recognize our humble beginnings and to allow Jesus to do in us what he chooses to do. You think you're smart? No amount of smartness will get you in. Doing okay financially? Won't get you there. Strong? Loud? Tricky? Pretty? Been through tough times? Think God owes you something? None of those things mean anything. Just, will you humble yourself? Deny yourself? Take up your cross daily and follow after him. And this power of God is what makes it so. Saved or not is determined by what you do with what you've been given. Even as that is justice and judgment. In other words, it might be that you deserve what you are getting. But what are you going to do with it? It might be that we deserve hell. In fact, the word says we do because of our sin. But what are we going to do with that? Are you going to turn that over to Jesus and let him change the way you end up? By God's zeal, which is his power and his passion activated, he will elevate us. And he'll never stop trying. And he never fails. The question is, are you ready to have Jesus as Lord of your life? Are you ready to be elevated from humble beings? Free 
to be the person that God made you to be. I ask the praise team to come forward and lead us in a closing hymn at this time. While I'm doing that, you might be thinking about, well, okay, my, my life is difficult. I've got these problems. I want you to think of all of those problems that you're facing as humble beginnings. You might even label one swaddling clothes. Or you might label one feet trough. That's what I mean here, by the way. Or you might label one stables. Or you might label one cold or poverty. You might label one poor parenting. You might label one accusation. And I think God is asking us, trusting with our outcome. Do you believe that God has the power to take you from your current humble circumstances into what you're going to be one day with Him? And if you believe in Him that way, repent today and turn to the Lord. And either for the first time ever give your life to Christ and say, I'm living for Jesus from now on because I know where I want to go when I'm done here. And I realize that I had to come from humble beginnings, but now I want to live for you. Or maybe if you already have done that, then you say, I know what I'm stuck on. I know where I'm continuing to be wrapped up, bound up. I know what aspect of my humble beginnings I am unwilling to accept, but I'm still fighting against it, or I'm still holding on to it, and I'm willing to let that go. I let Jesus have you do that today. <coughs> Maybe that looks like baptism, or it looks like serving God in some specific way. You humble yourself before the Lord of the universe. Hear me. It's not me asking. It's that baby in the man who is not the right hand of the Father willing to make questions as we sing. Would you stand with us and sing, and then if the Lord's leading you to, then you come forward and share with us what's on your heart today. Are you giving your life to Jesus for the first time ever today? Then you come and share. Are you committing something into his hands that you have not previously? You come and share. Are you repenting of some sin? You come and share. Here a key. Uh, it actually is a key to a pair of handcuffs, um, which are in my bag. I don't need the handcuffs for this illustration. If this was the key to heaven, we have offset the key to heaven is Jesus Christ, and He paid the price for our sins, and that's all true. You can't get there uh, if you don't, if you are one, unwilling to recognize that Jesus paid the price for sins. Then let's say for a moment you go, you know what? I get it. Jesus died on the cross for me. I do believe. Uh, commit my life into His hands. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. To take care of it. Then, if this was the key to heaven, that's what happens. Jesus gives you the key to heaven. No, so, so just like that. Matthew uh, sixteen. Jesus is speaking. I give you the keys to heaven. <laughs> Whatever you bind up on earth, be bound already in heaven. It's another translation. The Greek doesn't carry over the English super well in that case, but basically what it says. So, if you had the key to heaven. I ask you this, what would you do to keep it? I know where I'm going. So, like when I go to home, I have a push button lock on my house, but if I didn't have a push button lock on my house, I was driving home, I might think to myself, do I have the keys to get in when I get there? And before I had a push button lock, a couple of times I got home and I didn't have the keys when I got there. I had to break into my own house because I left my keys in my house. Do I got a push button lock? Would you be walking your days and someone someone says something bad to you, takes something from you, hurts you, or you fail in some way, you do something you shouldn't do, uh, you fail to speak up for Jesus, or you get involved with something that's going on that you shouldn't do, whatever? Might you go, hey, I wonder if I have the key still. Check your pocket. Oh, I still have the key to have it. I'm good. Keep on going. But what if, what if that isn't how it works? What if our trusting in Jesus, Lord, what's what we learned in Hebrews, our trusting in Jesus, and Jesus is there making intercession for you every day, every moment of every day. So Jesus was up there, and for a few minutes, Jesus said, you know what, I'm sick and tired of what that guy does. Or I'm sick and tired of what that girl does. I've had enough of her. And then you go check in your pocket and go, all right, where did I put that key to heaven? What if it was like that? Thankfully, Jesus doesn't quit. He fulfills his promises. He reminds us that we all come from humble beginnings. 
got to ask yourself, do you have the key to heaven? Well, let's assume you had the key to heaven, and you knew you had the key to heaven, and you wanted to. What are some of the things that you would do? Well, for one, you learn every last thing you possibly can from God. This hurts me, but I don't think you do. None of us. Now, if you are learning every last thing you possibly can from God, if you're one of those, please come and share with me and maybe make an argument for why that's true. But I will tell you right now, I do not learn every last thing I possibly can from God. And so I'm worried about that because if I don't, and I don't see anybody else who is, I'm kind of concerned about when Jesus comes again and he says, well, will the Son of Man find faithfulness on the earth when he comes again? If faithfulness includes us learning every last thing we can from the Son of God, from God, I feel like we're not doing it. And then I'm worried that maybe Jesus will come again and he won't find faithfulness. In fact, this is what I think is going to happen. I think there's going to be a whole lot of people, and I'm using an analogy here, okay? There's going to be a whole lot of people who are going to go, Jesus is going to hear that trump sound, and they're going to go, it's all right, I got the key in my pocket. I'm going to reach in there. And it's because they misunderstood what the key is. The key is recognizing that we come from humble beginnings and we trust Jesus every moment of every day. I've gone through some difficult times in my life and when I went through some difficult times, I've been driven to the Bible to read up on that topic. You ever do that? What do I do with this? I have a book at home that says, what does the Bible say about that? I love that book. I bought a copy for both my son-in-laws. And you can look up in there. It's not perfect. You can look up in there a thousand different topics, maybe five thousand. And read verses. It doesn't tell you what the verses mean. Read verses about what you want to know. What does the Bible say about this? So a number of times I've gone to that book, or I've had a look, and I say, okay, God, what do you want to go? And you know what God told me this week while I was preparing this sermon? Every time you run into a time where you don't know what the Bible says about that, it's because of one of two reasons. One, because I have put that time in your life specifically so that you will ask that question so you'll go there and read what it says. Right? That's one possibility. But more often than not, you don't know what it says about that or what to do about that because I tried to teach it to you over the remainder of the past years and you didn't get it. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but I'll give you an illustration. In our Tuesday night Bible study, for example, in the last three years, we've gone through three separate books of the Bible from beginning to end. Three from beginning to end. Every verse. We've also studied the Baptist faith and message, of which we're about two thirds or three quarters through, which we as a church say is what we believe scripturally. It's what we subscribe to. Now, you can't do Tuesday night Bible study for whatever reason, or you choose not to, that's fine. Then what are you replacing it with? So replace it with something. Get the book, the same book, and do it on a different day. Right? That's just an illustration. But I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about you. You make your own choice. Are you learning everything you can from God? That's just one example we're supposed to learn. But we're also supposed to share the gospel with everybody. If you've got the key, one way to surely know that you have the key is to share it with somebody else. First John says this, so when you share it with somebody else, they say they accept Christ, that doesn't mean you're saved. But when you share with somebody else and they say they accept Christ, and then that person goes and they share it with somebody and they accept Christ, you have every reason to believe that that first person was saved, which means you're probably saved. And that's circumstantially. You still have the Holy Spirit testifying inside you that you're saved. You can always know because he says so. But are you sharing the gospel with somebody? Are you telling them how valuable it is to know Jesus and to come from humble beginnings and be born? And when you do, you become a celestial being. And the Bible says that nobody can talk bad about you. And no undeserved curse cells. So my encouragement to you would be, do you have the key? And if you have the key, what are you doing about it? I'm laughingly thinking of the movie Ghostbusters, if you've ever seen it. Right? Do you have the key, master? Where is the gatekeeper? The little dude who doesn't deserve a beautiful woman, and then the beautiful woman is the gatekeeper, right? And that's the joke, is that he gets a beautiful woman, because he ne that he never would have gotten. He always liked her, but never could get with her, but he gets a beautiful woman, because he's a key. And so, so am I. We're the key masters. But let's live like it. Let's share the gospel. Study the word. Learn everything we possibly can from God. And don't let anything hold us back. You could be Billy Graham. You're like, oh, Billy Graham. Oh, well, no, don't do that. He's just some guy. In fact, I've seen his sermons. Read a number of what he wrote. And most of them were like a couple of verses written down on a piece of paper. They were, they're, not, they're not full sermons. He just got up there and preached. and just let God speak through him. He wasn't doing it. And he would tell everybody, I'm not doing this. God is doing this. And you can go down the list of everybody, anybody, George Finney, any, any evangelist you've ever heard of. You could be that person. Some of you in here, I've seen you. Mike, I've seen you share the gospel in such a powerful way. And, and lives be changed. And I've seen many of you do that. And you can do it. And you go like, well, I'm messed up. I can't decide what underwear to wear or keep my laundry clean or whatever. Yeah, we come from humble, humble beginnings. But God can do so much through us. As we, are a, we are becoming amazing and the world looks at you and goes, you're some kind of freak. I don't understand you. And well, they should because you don't belong here anymore. This is not your home. You're an ambassador from another kingdom, a kingdom that we will spend eternity in with God through Christ Jesus. And it's completely different there. The rules are different. 
we, we treat people with respect and kindness and goodness and we stand up for one another no matter what and we, we love the brothers and sisters and we don't have leaders. You're not going to get there in this. You know how many pastors there are in heaven? None. No pastors. Guess how many deacons are in heaven? None. Those are earthly titles that God gave us to serve here on the earth. That, they're gone. The moment you die, you go to heaven and you become a brother or a sister with Jesus. That's it. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you become like a lord or a king, all creation is yours. No more status, no more time, no more managers, no more CEOs, no more billionaires, no more influencers. Just God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and everybody who ever got it when he gave it. And that's us. If you're here today and you've not accepted Jesus Christ Lord and Savior, it's time to get the keys. Let's get running. Do something amazing for God. And if you're here today and you have accepted Jesus Christ, Lord, so you've got to stop being wrapped up in the things of this life and just go, yeah, I get it. This hurts me. But that pain I feel just reminds me of, of the fact that I come from humble beginnings and it's God's power and God's passion that make me what I am. And I'm going to do it. And I will let nothing stop me. Not because I'm unstoppable, which some of you may be, but because God is unstoppable. Awesome. These songs, Christmas songs, it's awesome. It's reminding us of what Jesus, how he started and how he ended. By the way, the angels sang of him that night, lit up the sky. So it wasn't like he had truly humble beginnings. But notice, they lit up the sky and sang to who? The shepherds, who were the lowliest of low. Nobody wanted to be around because they always stank and everything else. And then the shepherds went and they were received into the presence of the king. Fishermen are the majority of the disciples. Fishermen. You know, like a you know, I'm a construction worker. How can I be this awesome thing for God? Fisherman is who he chose as his disciples. What are you going to do with it? That's what it's all about. Look at your circumstances. Go ahead, but don't let them get a grip on you because you are better than anything you are going through. You were created with the ability to review the enemy, and you can do it. And freed in Christ, you can do it. And I've seen it. I've seen I've looked in the view, some people's eyes, and the dark space behind their people was so deep and so black. I sucked a soul right out of you, black. And then after having demons reviewed out of them, we're normal, like you or me. And then and got saved and began living for Jesus. And in both cases that I'm talking about that are like that, still living for Jesus to this day. And then there are lots of people who come and their situations not all that bad. They cry out to God and they get saved. And then the situation gets a little better a few weeks later and they walk away from God. That's not it. Got the key. No, you can't hold on to it, but Jesus can hold on to it for you. Share it with everybody. Let us be found faithful. For all we know, in a few hours, you may tell me, let us be found faithful. You're awesome. And don't let anybody tell you differently. But I can't, I can't, I can't. No, you can. In Christ, you can. You can do all things. So, Mike, would you pray us out? Father God, again, we we'll thank you for this day, this place, the time we come together and worship you. God, we'll thank you for the oh, message God. you gave our pastor. God, we'll thank you for sending the ultimate gift, the key holder. For yes, yes, God. yes. Pray we use that, and our key don't go or rust. Yes. God, you just use us however you see fit. Yes. God, I should be with us the rest of the day, whatever we may do. Thank you so much. Go you therefore and be the church.